media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. We're getting back engaged in the markets now, and it's Friday, and there's a little bit of sun shining here in Vancouver, so, hey, can't complain at all. Yeah, <laughs> oh, unless uh, it's about Vancouver snow removal, which is called rain. Yes. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of snow, yep. especially in the valley. So the, the Vancouver area has had everything over the past year. Yep. Record high temperatures and killed 800 people, then record flooding, then record yep. cold. So maybe we're due for a nice weather year. Oh, I'm all for it. And, and besides, if it wasn't for the weather, what else would we talk about, Bob? Oh, there's lots of dark Oh, there is way. <laughs> I know. That's the thing is we don't need the weather. Yeah. We don't need no stinking weather. Yeah. <laughs> Our Alfonso first... Badeo was, uh, was the actor who came out with that one. Oh, yes. Yeah, still a classic, isn't it? Oh, I, enjoy... I will look, sometimes look, just look for film clips of that guy because he was so appealing. Our first question comes from Ted. He says, I enjoy listening to your weekly radio shows where you interview various guests on stocks and investments. One question I have, which to my knowledge has never come up, is what would happen to my savings in a bank account after a government defaults on its debt? Is there a precedent? I'll keep listening for that answer. Best regards, Ted G. Yeah, Ted, that's a very careful question. And Canada, the banking system has been uh, very sound since the first banks were set up in, I think, uh, Bank of Montreal in 1818 or something like that. So, and, uh, so this is not a problem if you're in Canada. Then also they've got in the States far too much deposit insurance. So you got that coverage but the um if we go into a post bubble deflation of course uh, most asset prices will go down and this is what always follows a great bubble anyways uh there is a, a way to if you go to t bills or bank deposits you're going to the the return is going to be next to nothing but if one goes, and I've mentioned this before, say into a for, around a four-year maturity good-grade corporate bond, U.S., uh, you're going to be protected from price swings. You're going to be protected from uh, quality deterioration, and you'll get a higher return than just being in a, a, a bank deposit or a T-bill or something like that. And then if you're in Canada, uh, owning the U.S. bond, you're likely to get a uh, a bit of a more return out of the U.S. dollar going up relative to the Canadian. So, But that there'd be a run on savings in any of the big banks in Canada even under the most severe deflation, uh, seems unlikely. In the U.S., in the ni early 1930s on their crazy banking system, banks were failing all over the place. But we had the, the big banks in Canada. Sure, they shut down branches, but there were no failures. So, uh, now, uh, in Canada, you'll be okay. Now, of course, there is a precedent, uh, it was Cyprus. Uh, when Cyprus was in financial problem, they dipped into your bank account. They called it the Cyprus haircut. 
Oh, and, I had missed that one. Right. Yeah. And, oh, no, uh, and, uh, and lesser countries, yeah. you're vulnerable to uh, what governments may do. Uh, this is where in lesser countries uh, people have a tendency to save uh, small gold coins. You, you know, British sovereigns decades ago and stuff like that uh, against having to use them sometimes. So, but we're talking Canada and the U.S. here. So, Canada and the U.S., though, do have bank bail-in legislation. So in an extreme emergency, they have the legislation already in place that they could dip into your bank account. And I would suspect if you have more than $100,000, which is the insured limit in both Canada and the U.S., anything above that, they may skim. They call it the Cyprus haircut. Okay. Yeah. We have a question from Kathleen. And, Bob, we know there will be a musical reference in it. That's why we love Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she likes Canadian uh, references. We had uh, a reference there to Gordon Lightfoot and the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald in a question not too long ago. So Kathleen's question today, Jim and Bob, greetings for the new year. Every market seemed to rocket higher in 2021, except for precious metals. There just wasn't any love for gold out there. Many gold promoters from past years are now saying that we should sell our gold and go all in on Bitcoin. This lack of love for gold brings to mind Canadian Neil Young's song, Heart of Gold, where he sings, I've been a miner for a heart of gold and I'm getting old. Bob, gold's been performing dismally this past week. Could we have reached that often mentioned nine-year cycle top in gold in 2020? Will gold bugs be getting old, waiting for the next new high in gold? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, gold had a terrific rally uh, to uh, right up to July 2020 when our technical measures got overdone and the advice was that both investors and traders should take the money off the table and then last summer uh pointed out that hey uh we got no urge to look at these things until maybe november december and um so this recent weakness in the sector is in my mind the right direction and I think it's going to lead us to the buying opportunity that our technical work will be able to identify. And we particularly like, uh, you know, rather than buying gold or silver, we much prefer to buy the gold stocks right from seniors right down to juniors if you've got the experience for those ones. So one in each post-bubble contraction, sorry, back up one. In one of the key features in a great financial mania is that gold's real price goes down. And then gold stocks become the underperformers, which has been the case. But it looks like the gold's real price is trying to base. And then ironically, going the other way, uh, the uh, real price of copper goes up, which it did to last summer. And now it looks like it's correcting. So it looks like this bubble is climaxing in the sense that various sectors may have climaxed already. Other sectors have yet. But it is a very precarious situation, particularly with... uh, Lesser countries such as Turkey being in trouble and huge countries such as China being real, their, their contraction has started. So the, um, the next opportunity for gold is ahead of us. And once it gets turned, then the gold shares would outperform the S&P. Uh, it, not just gold shares going up but gold stocks outperforming the S&P. So it's going to be a terrific place to to be in. And uh, which case, there is a song, uh, the line goes in it, gold, silver, and gold, all you can hold is in your dreams or something like that. 
uh, oh, I can't think of the title of the song, but I'll try and remember it. But there is a line about gold, silver, and gold, all you can hold. But not this week. Wait until we get our technicals on it. A question from Michael. Hi, Jim and Bob. As of the market close on January 6th, four trading days into the new year, all the U.S. indices, precious metals, and almost everything else are down so far for 2022. I'm reminded of the January effect, which states that the first five trading days of the year will determine the, the, the direction the market will do for the remainder of the year. Bob, will the January effect give us a predictor of the direction of the market this year? Also, with the 10-year yield skyrocketing upward, can the 10-year Treasury still turn around and be a safe haven if a severe correction in the markets is ahead of us, or will it crash alongside the equity markets in the everything bubble? Yeah, double question here. Mm -hmm. uh, the January effect... I'm never too much of a fan for it. We've got our technical stuff here and the historical, and it it looks very precarious now. Uh, as I've said, the things are changing. The uh, U.S. dollar is firm, and that's part of a post-bubble contraction. Uh, the real price of copper is was up part of the boom, and it's declining a little, uh, perhaps hinting at contraction. Gold's real price is, 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 uh, was down, and that was in line with the way these things work. So, And then the other part is, it gets to your interest rates, that in the bubble, the real rate of interest as deflated by the Consumer price index heads down, and at its recent extreme, it was something like minus 6% in real terms. Now, this has happened, the minus has happened before in previous great financial bubbles. Uh, not 1929, but I think it was 1873. And then the real rate turns up, and that's a combination of the nominal rate rising, which, Michael, you're concerned about, and also with uh, weakening prices in, in the post-bubble deflation. And the rise can be in the order of 10 percentage points. It's, mo it's Mother Nature's way of correcting the excesses that uh, are part of a new financial era where very risky things are done at all levels. I mean, the risk out there is extraordinary. Uh, the central bank is is become very reckless and artificially lowered rates. That's forced uh, pension fund and uh, and casualty fund managers to buy junk uh, to try and get the returns they need. So the financial markets are completely crazy and uh, are vulnerable. So uh the yeah the the idea is that in your last part of it is <laughs> uh, the equity market alongside with the equity markets in an everything bubble. Yeah. In the post bubble contraction most asset prices deflate and this is then what brings the the real price of gold go up. And then as the real price of gold goes up, it reflects improving operating margins for miners. And they start to make money in the contraction. And the stocks uh, at some time in the future will really uh, outperform the S&P, for example. But uh, again, a good question. Uh, Bob, my question uh, from Laird James David from Scotland. Um, uh, he's wondering about these N NFTs, non fungible tokens, where some people are paying 250 grand for some graphic generated by a computer. And then, of course, they have the copyright for it and it can't be published without their permission and usually a payment to them. Is this the new version of Beanie Babies or, say, sports cards back in the 90s where they were going for impossible prices and then those markets crashed? 
I think you got a good one there, Jim. Yeah, Beanie Babies, Cabbage Patch Dolls. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, this is a the uh, bragging rights for getting into uh, a novelty way of owning a document or an image or whatever, and uh, I don't think uh, it'll survive. And the other one, of course, is the uh, Bitcoin. And crypto stuff, and uh, this is what reinforces that this has been the biggest financial mania in history, is that these are large cap vehicles that have recorded unbelievable gains. Like in the South Sea bubble in 1720, the, the key stock was the South Sea Company, and it went up by a factor of 10 times. And you can show that with various indexes and whatnot on other bubbles. But this thing is just extraordinary. Also, you can say that, sure, if you've got a penny mining stock and it turns out to be a darling globally, you, you, you get the same percentage gains that from a penny to, say, 30 or $40. But that's not big cap stuff. So you've got the, uh, the dot, or the Bitcoin and crypto stuff. It costs huge amounts of money and electricity to create which are essentially just counters to trade in the financial mania and it also not only does it cost to create them it costs huge to maintain them it's way different than in vancouver when hey decades ago you could create stock for about 15 cents a share and then once you got it all going, uh, you don't have to maintain anything. So I look at the Bitcoin and crypto stuff as uh, the miracle of, of the age and technology. And once, and it looks it's looking a little shaky lately, once it seriously breaks, then people will realize that these are very costly monsters to feed. And the only reason for feeding them is if the price is going up. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's hard to make the calls on these things because uh, uh, all of a sudden they turn around. But uh, well, I think the a real proper post-bubble contraction will uh, really hit the Bitcoin, crypto, and then this art or document buying things through uh, uh, crypto things or whatever, uh, I think they'll get hit as well. Uh, I'm always concerned if you have something that's purely electronic or digital, we could have a Carrington event like 1859 where a large solar flare yeah, fried yeah. all the world's telegraph lines. Of course, that was the only electrical product being used back then. Yeah, yeah. Or, or what if uh, Chinese or Russian hackers decide yeah. uh, to do a major attack. You're also very vulnerable there. Oh, yeah. I read one uh, recently here about uh, some crypto product. It was Somebody managed to grab $150 million with it. Uh, yep. we, we also have a fraud case where some uh, publishing house employee uh, purloined uh, the works of uh, several major authors, uh, and apparently it was not for resale that he would secretly sell them but he just liked to collect them like the secret art collectors like the the one in the u.s who was recently busted and returned them after he was fined i think a hundred million dollars yeah I, i'm not sure about the exact yeah. amount but yeah but you see again those were physical properties that still exist somewhere uh, well there's a delightful <clears throat> movie with audrey hepburn and peter o'toole in it called how to steal a million yeah and it has something to do with fraudulent art and it's a very charming movie so audrey's always great oh lordy yes indeed we'll have more with bob hoy right after this don't miss out stay informed receive the howstreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts radio and articles delivered to your inbox sign up for the howstreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at howstreet.com Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Some headlines that caught Bob's attention today. China's real estate problems 
are now spreading to their once healthy developers. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Uh, when the trend is on, everybody gets leveraged, and some people get more leveraged than others. And then when the trouble start, it starts with the most leveraged, and unfor- unfortunately, it eventually get those who perhaps have been a little more careful in their balance sheets. But that's the way markets go, uh, straight up le- leverage and then uh, run out of momentum and then down and everybody gets deleveraged, some very painfully. Global equity funds attract big inflow- inflows at the start of the new year. What's going on there? Well, yeah, it was kind of like everybody by the stock market and they, they, they it's got everything going like you oftentimes you can have a, a weak crude oil price into uh, January February and that will take the stock market down but there's a lot of bidding for some of the very of the hot commodities not as not as many as at various times during the last year, but there is kind of like an everything bid out there, but I think it's beginning to falter. So uh, we just watch and see what's happening here. But uh, the other one that we watch is that in uh, you, you can have outstanding uh, speculative events, complete in January, one of the biggest was the huge speculation in gold and silver in 1980, and I think the high day was January 22nd or something like that. And uh, then also back with the uh, Tokyo Nikkei bubble, which was all on its own, it was a fabulous bubble, it peaked on the last trading day of the year in 1989. A uh, very important bull market peaked in January of 1973, and the worst bear market in uh, since the 1930s followed. So you you can have a speculative phenomenon rush up and complete in January, uh, but. This this thing, like commodities peaked a while ago, uh, Bitcoin a while ago. So this one looks like a test. Uh, but anyways, maybe let's call it the whole spirit of speculation may be peaking now. And also, the uh, financial, uh, the political markets are absolutely crazy as well. And uh, I've got this really weird idea that when the financial markets deflate, with all its craziness, that the crazy uh, politics will also deflate as well. The air will go out of it just like that. It's it's difficult to explain. I just want to mention it, and maybe at some future one I can get into some of the historical details on the link between financial markets and political markets. Uh, when we interviewed Ray Merriman, uh, uh, he likes to use uh, the positions of the planets, the moon, and the sun. Not the stars, so it's not astrology yeah. per se, but he looks at all these different cycles. And he's predicting uh, in the near future that the move in politics will be towards the middle. People have seen enough of extremes, either extreme right or extreme left. Yeah, I'd be interested in, in seeing his work. Well, maybe. he was on yeah. uh, This Week in Money just a few weeks ago. Okay. I'll and look it up. so yeah. I, I remember that uh, particular mm-hmm. thing he said in politics. A- and yeah. again, he said, these aren't my personal views. I'm just looking at these charts. And he's been doing this for 40 years and has been yeah. pretty pretty damn accurate. It's yeah, good for him. Good yeah. stuff. But, but like he points out, uh, the planets uh, in astronomical terms are nearby. And of course, they influence each other. With their gravity stars, the star light you're seeing right now is billions of years old, and that star doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, most likely. Now, uh, another headline that caught your eye, Turkey spent seven three, uh, $7.3 billion propping up its lira just in December. Uh, is this going to be yeah. a, well, a successful it's, foray it's by them? Yeah, they, they're, it, actually it was last March when they... Uh, 
March, it was Argentina, Turkey, and South Africa announced that their central banks were running out of the main reserve, U.S. dollars, which uh, is important when you're in a financial bubble year. And uh, so, but then what happens is that the it, it, short rates go up and the, the uh, currency goes down and people get very distressed. So then that puts some political pressure on the leaders and then the leader, Erdogan or whatever his name is, then probably put the pressure on the central bank and said, We've got to support it, and uh, they'll support it until they run out again, run out of uh, reserves. And then uh, the International Monetary Fund. God, I haven't heard anything about those guys in ages. Would typically come along and try and bail the thing out, but uh, no, it's very important uh, to follow what's going on in these outside uh, financial markets because that contraction will eventually hit the senior financial markets in in London and New York. So uh, this is where you get to quote Marcus Tilius Cicero, isn't it? Cicero, yeah, he 2000 years ago. He was a brilliant writer, a very clever guy. And he pointed out that uh, when there was a financial problem in the eastern provinces, meaning uh the eastern end of the Mediterranean, and, and there was a lot of free trade in those days with uh, ships going from one place to another with complete freedom. And uh, as he pointed out, if you have a financial problem in the eastern provinces, it will hit Rome. Does this mean we should be helping out places like Turkey and Argentina that seem to have continuous uh, monetary problems, or should we just let them dangle on their own? Or will that come home oh, to no, roost? The IMF will try and do something when it gets serious. These guys are built in to try and protect things and fix things. But that's closing the barn door after the horse is bolted. Uh, no, in a financial mania, everybody gets crazy. And then finally the prices break. And then everybody suffers. And uh, but you you cannot. Like, I mean, to me, the artificial lowering of interest rates by the Federal Reserve has forced life companies to buy garbage bonds. I mean, it's just it, it's just absolutely revolting. So uh, I think this one, when it fails, it will prompt a reform where the public are going to say, look at you spent trillions of dollars of essentially taxpayer money, because we're ultimately on the line for it, in trying to keep booms going. And I think it will be part of a reform movement whereby the uh, Federal Reserve would be forced to go to gold standard so that they then have at least that discipline and will be unable to <laughs> create credit out of nowhere for partying. You know the old saying about when the Fed is is providing the punch ball, everybody drinks until they fall down. So, and uh, Bob, I've noticed uh, when some countries have these very weak currencies, they offer terrifically high interest rates. But uh, if you went and, say, bought one of those uh, 29% bonds, is there a good chance they'll default on it? Yeah, not only that, but the the, uh, the payment, uh, the return, you're, you're buying it in, in, a, in a vulnerable currency. So you don't want to be long an instrument <laughs> where the currency is going to crash and the bond will crash and that kind of thing, so... Well, most international loans are in U.S. dollars, and of yeah. course, you've pointed out in a post-bubble contraction, the U.S. dollar tends to be very strong, so that debt that you took out on U.S. dollars will not just be the interest rate that yeah. you promised, no, but got, the actual value of the currency. Yeah. Uh, outside countries and, and uh, corporations, all you need in the financial center, which is now New York, is the majority of the funds to be uh, the loans to be made in senior currency terms now the US dollar it used to be 
London was the financial capital and sterling was the senior currency. But once the bubble boom is over, then everybody who borrowed too much gets completely riveted on servicing that debt. And in this case, if you owe U.S. dollars again, <laughs> it, you have to get your hands on U.S. dollars and service your obligations in New York. So the the debt bubble is actually a huge short position of U.S. dollars. And right now, all of the inflation and commodity bugs are out there saying, oh, they're going to depreciate the dollar, it's going to go to zero, the Fed is evil, all that sort of stuff. But they don't understand that in a post-bubble contraction, one of the problems is that the senior currency becomes chronically firm. And uh, for most of the time. So that's... A, and actually, the U.S. dollar... Uh, in the first half of uh, last year, built a wonderful base and then did its classic breakout above the 20-week uh, exponential moving average and is in a very fine uptrend. And uh, if it breaks out of the recent level, I think it'll be associated with turmoil in the financial markets. Now, uh, we have these... Uh Riots in Kazakhstan, they've brought in Soviet paratroopers to quell the unrest. Yeah. Uh, video from there, you can hear the machine gun fire. Soviet or former Soviet paratroopers, not really known for their uh, kindness and generosity. Oh, no. uh, anyway, uh, any chance, and that, and all these riots started when, uh, petrol or their fuel prices went up. Yep. They, they use some kind of hybrid propane gasoline thing. But it, that doesn't really matter. Uh, if, if we had supply shortages here or our inflation went up, I, I don't suspect that, A, we would have riots in the streets, or, no, B, they, Russian uh, paratroopers called in to quell it. No, uh, Canadians are not that excitable, but in countries that are have a tendency to be excitable, you get these things happening like this, but... The problem is that in a boom, uh, commodity prices go up, and then you also had the U.S. administration try and shut down as much of uh, natural gas and, and oil production and transportation as they could, as is the Canadian government, and so you've had uh, a sharp rise in the cost, basic cost of energy. And then in Europe right now, they're absolutely mad uh, and uh, shut down nuclear power and uh, trying to do it all with windmills and solar, and that's not working. So the public in many countries are protesting against uh, soaring prices for energy that are essentially prompted by crazed governments so uh, it's dreadful to see the problems in Kazakhstan uh, I'll think about it before I decide whether the Russians are doing the right thing or not but quite possibly a firm hand uh, is required otherwise uh, riots can go on forever like uh, where in the US and Portland and Seattle, they allowed the riots to run forever and do billion dollars of damage with arson and all that sort of stuff. So maybe uh, the Russians might set a good example by quelling a damaging uprising. Uh, also, uh, rising energy prices, uh, the International Energy uh, Association says there's, uh, or agency, it says there's a shortage of investment in oil and gas exploration right now because all these institutional investors have decided uh, it's going to go into windmills instead. Yep. Uh, and uh, they are saying maybe a hundred, two hundred dollar a barrel oil, and that would mean Vancouver is very close to two dollars a liter for oil, or just over six dollars a U.S. gallon. So. Um, uh, for people in Vancouver, I think we're so used to being the highest uh, priced gasoline in North America anyway that there probably won't be much fuss. And we have the most uh, Teslas. 
<laughs> but we also have the most exotic sports cars yep. in North America here as well. Oh, yeah. And, and those do. people can afford whatever the price of gasoline is. Yeah. So that, well, that's an I interesting think that, thing. Uh, that uh, uh, the rise in energy prices is going to set up a, a, a reaction, a, pop, a popular uprising against those crazy folks in government that are forcing the artificial rise in these prices. And uh, But what you've also got here is that uh, uh, some of our technical tools are suggesting that the rise in the CRB, the commodity index, has now become vulnerable. So we'll just watch and see. Uh, but uh, as I say, crazy governments, crazy financial markets, and crazy central bankers. Uh, and the, the, the consequence is not going to be happy. Uh, our last headline we're going to take a look at. U.S. firms extend credit at ballistic pace betting on recovery. Yep. The, all part of the excitement here. Uh, over the last uh, couple of months of uh, let's get positioned, and it's the kind of like the everything bubble, uh, and uh, becoming very vulnerable. So we'll uh, we'll wrap that one up, Jim, and just say that the financial markets are precarious. Bob, thank you so much for being on the show. Jim, good to be with you, and looking forward to talking next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. He was speaking to us from Vancouver. Bob loves to answer your questions, so if you'd like to have your question answered, send it to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.